All right, welcome. Welcome everyone to the Neighborhood Improvement Strategy, a comprehensive community initiative workshop. <laughs> That's a handful um, or a mouthful, I mean. Um, we are, as mentioned in the chat, um, we just started the live stream, but we're gonna give it just a couple minutes so that we can allow everyone who wants to hop into this session to join. Um, so we will be getting started in probably 1.5 minutes now. So, so feel free as we're waiting to um, to put your introduce yourself in the chat, put your name, where you're from, um, things like that, and um, I'll uh, be giving an official welcome and introduction as well as additional instructions. So again, uh, we'll be getting started in about one one and a half minutes. Okay, I think that was about two minutes. So, um, so we are going to go ahead and kick off this session. Um, again, thank you so much for joining us today for the Neighborhood Improvement Strategy, a comprehensive community initiative workshop. Um, we're so glad to have you here with us, and we're really looking forward to a great day with you here at the 2021 NUSA conference uh, hosted by this by Fort Worth. Um, my name is Laura De La Vega, and I am from the city of Garland, which is located in Texas, um, and I work in the Office of Neighborhood Vitality, and I'm going to be your host during this workshop. Um, so before we start, I do want to point out all of the different ways that you can share feedback and ask questions and um, also network with everyone. Uh, now, you don't have to use any of these tools if you don't want to, but they're all great ways for you to interact with everyone. Um, so first, let's go ahead and look at the right hand of your screen um, to the inbox. It's at the very top right. Um, when you see a, a number in green or in red pop up, that means that someone at the conference has sent you a message. And so to read it, you just click on it and then you'll respond the same way. Um, below that, the next tab down is the chat room. And so this is the perfect place, um, as I mentioned before, to say hi to everyone, introduce yourself, where you're from. Um, you can make comments here. Um, now, all of these comments are public for everyone. So, um, so don't put any private comments in there. <laughs> um, but uh, it's just a great way to be engaged in today's workshop. Um, the next tab is for uh, questions. So during the presentation, if you have a specific question that you'd like asked, go ahead and write it there. And so once the presentation is over, I'm going to go back through that list um, of questions and then um, I'll ask, uh, I'll verbally ask the presenter and we'll respond and get those uh, answered for you. Um, I will also keep an eye on, um, keep an eye on it. And if your question is already um, answered throughout the present, like in the presentation later, I'll just go ahead and check mark that as answered. Um, so, uh, but we will do our best to respond to all the questions at the end of the presentation. Um, below that, you will see the poll section. Uh, I don't think we have any polls for this particular session, but if we did, that's where you'd find it. 
Um, and then below the polls is the people's tab where you can see the list of everyone who is attending this workshop with you. Um, you you're also able to click on the names um, of the participants and see their contact information. Um, and if you'd like, you can click on there's a, like a blue thought bubble and you can send them send them a quick private message. Um, so any messages that you send through that section will go straight to their inbox and that will be private. So that's where you could do the private, <laughs> the private messages. Um, and then the last tab, this is where you will find additional resources for this workshop. And so that's where all the files are, um, the presentation, I believe the presentations there, um, there's some videos that we'll be showing. And so I believe those videos are there as well. Um, but you know, even after this conference is over, you will still have access to those files um, and to this session, because this session is being recorded. Um, and you'll have access to it until the end of August, which is amazing. Um, so if you by chance implement any of these ideas or programs that you hear, uh, you can still hop on here, put some comments, let us know how it goes. Um, and so we'd love to hear from you. Uh, I think that's all the network working resources that I needed to cover. Um, so please let me welcome uh, Mr. Victor Turner from the city of Fort Worth. He is here to discuss the Neighborhood Improvement Strategy, a comprehensive community initiative. So let's give it up for Mr. Victor. Thank you, Laura. Uh, that was a mouthful. So those of you that have not introduced yourselves, uh, please do so in the chat. Uh, welcome to Fort Worth virtually. Uh, wish you all could be here. It's beautiful weather today. Rain has held off. And I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, some of the things that we've done to uh, enhance our neighborhoods and, and make them a little bit more uh, uh, aesthetically pleasing and attractive and to stimulate investment in those neighborhoods. And uh, we'll take questions. If you have a question during the presentation, that's fine. I think uh, we say it at the end, but if you want to stick something in the chat during the, during the presentation, that is okay. So, uh, also, before I get started, if if you want to put in the chat some major issue that you all are facing in your various neighborhoods, uh, please put that in as well. So we'll kind of have an idea of what are some things that you would like to see improved uh, in your particular uh, parts of the country. So we'll talk a little bit about our neighborhood improvement strategy, uh, how we started it, uh, how long it's been in existence how we go about selecting neighborhoods, uh, the before and after surveys that we do with the residents of particular neighborhoods so that we can measure if there's been any substantial improvement uh, after we've invested the resources, uh, a little bit about the meetings that we have with the uh, residents of the neighborhoods and our various departments and how we work. Even though uh, Neighborhood Services is the lead agency, we work with uh, a lot of city departments in implementing the program also how we measure uh, the effectiveness, our tracking and reporting. And then we'll look at some successes. Uh, a big part of the program is crime prevention. And so we have some videos that we'll share with you uh, from Fort Worth PD, uh, and also look at some of the improvements that have taken place in one of our neighborhoods named Stop Six, uh, lessons learned, and then uh, talk about some, some ways that you may want to uh, implement some um, program similar to, to the one that we have. So why neighborhood improvement strategy? As you can see back in 2016, uh, the city of Fort Worth looked at uh, various neighborhoods across the city and what were some of the things that we could address. One being um, property values, uh, looked at the number of building permits uh, that have been issued uh, before and after. Look at unemployment rate in a particular neighborhood. What is the household income in that area? Uh, what is the uh, percent of high school graduates? Crime, uh, code issues like substandard structures, and then infrastructure. What is the street condition uh, in a particular neighborhood? 
Uh, this on the left, you can see some of those measures uh, and the right in the various categories. And some of them now point out what I just mentioned. Uh, we look at unemployment rate, household income, what is the education of the residents in a particular neighborhood, uh, the public safety or crime stats, uh, the infrastructure. And also we looked at things like uh, health and uh, are, are the, is the area of food desert, uh, just livability factors. Uh, this is a uh, several maps that kind of look at some of the, the items that I talked about. I don't know how well y'all can see that. Uh, but we basically have graphically displayed those items that I just touched on. I was going to say, if you guys say amen in the chat, we'll get through it real quick. Also, here are some of the short and long-term goals of the program. One, uh, as I mentioned, crime is a big component of the program. We want to improve public safety. We want to utilize our resources to improve the physical characteristics of the neighborhood. And then a big part of it is community engagement, bringing the neighbors together, working on a project uh, to improve their neighborhood. And then long-term, the economic revitalization of the neighborhood and some various supportive services to uh, create self-sufficiency and reduce poverty. The program actually started in 2017. Uh, you can see we funded from a half cent of the municipal property tax. Since that time, we've transitioned to uh, funding that's still remaining uh, from that tax. The program has grown from two and a half million to now a little over three million that's set aside uh, each year uh, for the selection of a different neighborhood and implementation of the program. So you can see uh, Stop 6 uh, in East Fort Worth was our first neighborhood in Ash Crescent, Northside, Rosemont, and Como, which we just selected in January. You can see the mouse budgeted for each one of those uh, neighborhoods. Down below, capital projects, some of the things we do working with our public works department, uh, infrastructure improvements like sidewalk construction, street lights, repaving, uh, with our parks department, uh, some park improvements, uh, uh, tree planting, uh, public safety, we work with police, uh, then our code enforcement, we do a lot of cleanup, eliminate blight. Uh, and then we have some money for admin to do outreach and mail outs and uh, pay for some staff time. Our process, uh, we identify uh, through our uh, neighborhood profile areas, uh, which neighborhoods are distressed and what are some of the characteristics uh, that cause it to be distressed. Uh, we analyze that information. Uh, look at our objectives and I'll share with you a, a spreadsheet a little later of how we we score those neighborhoods and then we review that as a as a team and share that with uh, our city manager's office and of course the council members involved during this process uh, before we uh, release it to the public. Some of the criteria we look for and look at in Selecting a neighborhood, uh, you can see those that are highlighted kind of a orange or yellow uh, crimes against people, uh, broadband internet access and food desert, they are weighted a little bit more in pavement condition index, are weighted a little more heavily uh, than the other areas. But as I previously mentioned, household income, poverty rate, unemployment rate, uh, percent of the population without a high school diploma, uh, substandard structure violations, so code issues. And then, has there been any other type of leveraging of projects in that neighborhood, as well as the capacity of the neighborhood association and the leadership? So we work with our community engagement uh, team to see just how active has the leadership been in that neighborhood? What are some of the things that uh, they've been doing? Uh, are they regularly having neighborhood association uh, meetings? So we measure all of that as part of the uh, selection process. This is a spreadsheet that I mentioned to you that uh, we utilize to score the neighborhoods. As you can see across the top, 
is the name of the various neighborhoods that we looked at uh, this past year. And some of the factors that I just uh, talked about, I believe at the bottom of the, the spreadsheet, it may be chopped off, but we have a neighborhood conditions score and then a the neighborhood capacity and leveraging scores and then an overall score. So as you can see, it's weighted in each one of these categories. And then we look at what the total score based on the various metrics to select the neighborhood each year. So this is completely data driven um, based on these metrics that we have listed. So it takes out a lot of the uh, guesswork and political pressure to select uh, any particular council members, uh, a neighborhood in their district or ward. So this is uh, the process that we use to analyze uh, information, census data information to select our neighborhood uh, for the neighborhood improvement dollars each year. Uh, this is another view. Uh, after we've gone through and analyzed all the data, we narrow it down to three neighborhoods and share that information so council won't have to look at a whole list of you know 10 12 15 neighborhoods that we're looking at so we'll take the top three and list them side by side and look at the uh, various areas and how they score this is another view of um, the rankings here uh, where we take all the neighborhoods and each one of these categories that you see shaded dark blue shows where that particular neighborhood ranked uh, against the others in the categories that we measure. For example, uh, Como is ranked one here, but it had the lowest uh, median household income. So that's why it was first in that category because it was, had the worst condition as far as income. And you can see how the others are ranked across the board in the different areas. So it's just another way of graphically showing uh, how the neighborhoods stacked up against each other and when we did our scoring. This is a flow chart that looks at our overall process. As you can see, uh, our annual process, it starts in, in December. Uh, council members announce um, a chosen neighborhood and we work very closely with our council members uh, ask them for what neighborhoods they would like to see considered uh, as we do our analysis there may be some that we have uh, not taken into consideration that they feel need to be looked at more closely so we work very closely with our council uh, we start having uh, neighborhood uh, leadership meetings but prior to that after we kind of identify the issues and set boundaries. You can see there's a survey. We have our neighborhood leadership meeting. Uh, then we have a kickoff meeting. Um, January is about the time we had a survey. That kickoff meeting is around March. And then we follow up, as you can see, the flow with uh, developing priorities, budget, uh, working with the neighborhood. Uh, we've had several meetings with uh, each of our neighborhoods that have been selected with our most recent one being Como and uh, extensive meetings and discussions about budget and priorities. And so uh, this is not something that's done within two weeks or three weeks, it's uh, several months in the process. As I mentioned, we do a survey beforehand, so we get an idea from the neighbors how they feel about their particular neighborhood, uh, and then we do a survey afterwards. So did we have any uh, measurable impact uh, with that investment of, of dollars in their neighborhood, and how has it improved uh, their neighborhood overall? So budget, as I mentioned, we work with several other departments establishing a budget for the items that uh, typically uh, neighborhoods select uh, that they want done in their area. And so we establish that budget and work closely with those departments to make sure they adhere to that. So this is just an example of, of one of the components of the program. I mentioned collaboration with other departments. We couldn't make this work unless we work closely with uh, 
several departments, uh, police department, our public works team, code enforcement, our community engagement uh, staff, uh, as well as uh, our parks department are the major uh, departments that we uh, collaborate with as part of the program. Tracking and reporting. So we track the program in two ways. One, based on the budget and also have the objectives been met. So to the left, you can see the budget. So we track to make sure the items that were selected uh, to be part of the program, where are we on expenditures? Uh, that's one of the major emphasis of our city manager's office is that we uh, get the resources out there and the projects get done in a timely manner. So we keep track of each one of the line items where it is at any particular point, uh, if we need to make adjustments in any of these areas and move dollars around. So we track that and see where we are at any point in time during the process. And then on the right, what were some of the outcomes? Uh, linear feet of sidewalks constructed, tons of vegetation removed, a uh, number of security cameras installed. So those are some of the things that uh, we keep track of that were selected by the neighborhood and uh, our team uh, for implementation in a particular area. One of the things that uh, we have had uh, a lot of questions about, you invest all this money in a particular neighborhood, uh, are you uh, creating gentrification? Particularly, we a lot of these are low moderate income neighborhoods, but you can see uh, here in Stop 6, which was the first neighborhood selected, uh, which had gone years with lack of investment now the, the, the neighborhood is starting to turn around and a lot of uh, new homes being built. Just recently, uh, we were selected as uh, for a choice neighborhood initiative grant uh, with our working with our housing authority here for Worth Housing Solutions. So from two, 2015 to th 2019, you can see how property values have increased in the stop six, which is encouraging. Uh, so it's almost keeping pace with how the DFW area is property values are increasing. Building permits, another thing that we look at and measure. So are more people starting to pull permits and, and whether it's commercial or residential in a particular neighborhood after we've gone in and made some improvements. So you can see that's on a steady incline in our stop six neighborhood. Fact is nearly double from 2015 to 2020, as you can see, or has doubled. What is the investment value of those permits? That's another metric that we look at to see just exactly what is the value of the permits being pulled. So you can see that has increased over time. Also, we give regular updates and with with the council of where we are in a particular neighborhood. So here's some of the things we look at, you know, our expenditures, what percent of the work has been completed, has crime uh, gone down as a result of some of the measures we put in place, such as the cameras. And you'll, you'll see an interesting video in a little bit of how, that, how effective uh, those security cameras are. And then the investment, we just talked about permits and permit value. So all of those things we track Successes. I believe here is the video. Laura. Perfect. Victor, I'm sure I'll go ahead and play it. Well, before you, before you um, play the video, uh, one of the things I, I failed to mention before we get to the video, just recently uh, we received um, several million in CARES Act dollars. And one of the issues, particularly with kids working or uh, going to school virtually at home was having access to Wi-Fi throughout the, the community. Well, one of the ways that we went about how we were gonna target that and select what areas to put in Wi-Fi with some of the CARES dollars, where we looked at our neighborhood improvement areas where we had already looked at a lot of the data in our IT department, uh, chose those neighborhoods to start with uh, putting Wi-Fi access uh, in some public areas so people could have access to, to work from home or do their schoolwork at home. So wanted to point that out before we played the video. So the video coming up 
is going to be about uh, stop six, um, which was six stop along the railroad. That's how a railroad line, that's how it got its name. Uh, Council Member Bivens will be narrating the video, but it gives you kind of a summary of uh, how this program has impacted that particular neighborhood, which was struggling for a long time uh, with crime and just a lack of investment. So, Laura, if you can go ahead and, and play that. Uh, Victor, can you hear me? All right. Councilwoman Gina Bivens coming to you from Stop Six, Stop the six. community where I grew up and where I live. Okay. So sorry, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and mute that. There we go. Day. There is nothing that sparks excitement and optimism like the sites of new construction. And they're building new homes all over Stop Six, but it didn't happen overnight. It started with a spark from City Hall. Stop Six Capital was Fort Worth's first neighborhood improvement strategy project. The two and a half million dollar project initiative began in January of 2017, focusing on a small area with higher than average crime and lower than average income. Just over a year later, the changes are striking. It is a godsend. It is beautiful. We have not had this kind of development for our community and for for the people who live in our community. The city has installed more than 300 new street lights, making the neighborhood safer at night. Security cameras installed at key locations have helped police make arrests. Before the city's initiative, vacant buildings like this one attracted vagrants or worse. The city has demolished 20 dilapidated buildings cleaned up dozens of abandoned structures, and hauled away the debris, making vacant lots ready for redevelopment. And developers like Mark Gentry are taking notice. He has half a dozen single-family homes under construction and plans to build 10 to 15 more by the end of 2018. Well, I'm from this area, and I just want to be able to give back. I'm a minority-owned business, and I'm just looking to be a part of the acceleration of this growth of this community. That growth includes not just increases in the number of building permits, but also the dollar value of investments in Stop 6. More than $9 million in 2017, and more than $7 million in the first half of 2018. Just take a look at some of the other improvements the city has made in Stop 6. 278 tons of brush and trash cleared from right-of-ways. 373 dead and hazardous trees removed. More than 180 tons of litter and illegal dump sites cleaned up. 7,500 linear feet of new sidewalks make it safer for children to walk to school and parks. Dozens of new curb ramps make it easier for residents of all ages and abilities to get around. And Rosedale Plaza Park has a brand new playground benches, picnic tables, and walking trail. Partly because of the city's initiative, U.S. Housing and Urban Development Secretary Ben Carson visited the Martin Luther King Jr. Community Center in Stop 6, announcing that center will become an Envision Center, the only one in Texas. Those centers will connect area families with the tools they need to become self-sufficient. HUD's mission is creating affordable housing. This ties into that mission and goal of creating home ownership opportunities for the American dream. The city's neighborhood improvement strategy has helped make Stop 6 a cleaner, safer community. And we continue working with the residents to keep that momentum going. But the beauty of the city's neighborhood improvement strategy is that it can be duplicated, building strong communities throughout Fort Worth. For more information, visit fortworthtexas.gov slash neighborhoods. Gina Bivens, City of Fort Worth. Thank you, Laura. So as you can probably tell from her voice, Ms. Bivens used to be a, a news reporter and anchor, so a very distinct voice in describing her neighborhood. 
but that gave you an overall uh, view and summary of what went on and what is still going on in Stop Six neighborhood. I think there was a question about um, rehab and on houses, a lot of new construction going on in Stop Six. We do have federal programs like many of the other cities around the country uh, to do owner-occupied rehab. And then we also have neighborhood empowerment zones that have incentive for folks to uh, make improvements. So there are some, some tools in place for continued uh, improvement and development of individual homes, not just uh, only uh, new construction. We also have our second neighborhood that was selected is Ash Crescent. And uh, Council Member Kelly Allen Gray was going to give you a little bit of a summary of what went on in Ash Crescent, the second neighborhood that was uh, selected for this program. So if you go ahead and play that one, uh, Laura. Laura, can you hear me? If you would go ahead and play the next video of Ash Crescent. Uh, yes, sir. Just one. Work is underway in Ash Crescent after the city identified this area of South Fort Worth as needing a lot of help. We will spend $2.7 million here to help clean up and revitalize the neighborhood. It all started with community meetings and a survey to let residents tell us what they needed and wanted most. Their top priorities, crime prevention and cleanup. They put the cameras up, they didn't cut down on the dumping. I like the part where they didn't, they cut the trees, they didn't clean up the alleyways, they mowed all the vacant lots, and cleaned up, you know, picked up around the area. Well, I've seen more police uh, driving by, and uh, I've seen a lot of trash being picked up. Before, overgrown trees and brush made this street nearly impassable before and after city crews cleaned up illegal dump sites. Before. And after demolishing substandard buildings to make way for new homes. Meanwhile, Neighborhood Services has helped 22 families apply for more than $250,000 in funds for repairs to their homes. Work is underway at 21 homes, including this one on Ash Crescent, where crews have replaced a dangerous gas heater, installed air conditioning, and will treat lead-based paint this summer. But the improvements are more than just physical. The city is helping build community, too. <laughs> Neighbors of all ages joined the mayor's recent walking town hall, then shared food and fun at the first ever community carnival. Children played on a pint-sized obstacle course built by volunteers, Others were fitted for a new bike helmet, or many just chilled with free books, compliments of our partner, Trinity Basin Preparatory. Free educational activities for children continued this summer, provided by area churches, service agencies, and the city of Fort Worth. The city has done their part, but it's up to us to keep it up. You know, we can't expect the city to do everything. That can-do spirit has led to a creation of a new neighborhood association. They've already held their first cleanup and membership is growing. They're coming because they're interested. Once they hear about it, uh, they see it's legit. I think it's becoming infectious, so it's growing. There's more to be done in Ash Crescent, but I'm proud to say this city neighborhood business community partnership is off to a strong start. To learn more about the Ash Crescent revitalization efforts, go to fortworthtexas.gov slash Ash Crescent. Fantastic. So you saw a little bit about Stop 6 and then the Ash Crescent neighborhood. And what I, I think is most interesting is that uh, in addition to some of those uh, community development and housing related improvements is the 
is the crime element and reduction of, of criminal activity in these neighborhoods as a, a result of surveillance cameras and flock cameras. Those of you not familiar, the flock cameras are able to read uh, license plates. And that's been an interesting topic uh, with some of our neighborhoods talking about the, the implementing or installing uh, cameras in their neighborhood uh, hoods to see if it's infringing upon uh, some of them's privacy. We've seen that it has been a tremendous advantage to have uh, those cameras installed uh, to reduce crime. And uh, one of the examples is Stop 6. And there is a short police video. There's going to be some, uh, it's no uh, sound. You'll just see some, some writing describing the activity. But to give you a little preview, uh, it's going to show where there was a, I believe, a stolen vehicle and a person is hiding in some bushes. And as a result of the cameras, uh, the police are able to apprehend uh, that suspect. So if you go ahead, Laura, and play that next uh, video from Fort Worth Police Department. I guess I have to do a little narrating. As you can see, it was uh, listed as a stolen vehicle that you could a silver vehicle uh, driving along the road there. In a little bit, you'll see an example of how the fly camera works. It's going to zero in on the license plate uh, of the vehicle shortly. You see on the screen there are over 30 of these type of cameras that have been installed in Stop 6. Uh, those flock cameras that are, are able to, to zoom in and identify the license plates number have been really helpful in reducing crime in Stop 6. And there'll be a graphic a little later showing just how much uh, crime has been reduced uh, in that particular neighborhood. But I want you to hold on. This is the most interesting part that's coming up. Uh, you can see there's a call resulting in a foot chase. I mentioned to you earlier, the suspect uh, is hiding in the shrubs there next to that, that building uh, on the screen, the kind of red brick building. Uh, police doesn't know where he is right now, but they'll later come back and, and find him hiding. So this is a result of those uh, security surveillance cameras in the neighborhood helping police uh, apprehend suspect. Example here, help with a car accident. So not only we use the cameras for uh, police, also our code enforcement, uh, department uses cameras to help identify illegal dumping and police are able to uh, get footage from uh, codes and help uh, arrest folks that have done uh, illegal dumping to find them. Here's a situation where some young folks have got into a, a scuffle and you can see cameras are able to, to show what's going on there and police were sent to the scene.
Uh, I think there was a, a comment about we have a crime control uh, district that has dollars that are funded uh, CCPD, but we also utilize our uh, neighborhood improvement dollars in neighborhoods that have been selected to be able to even put in additional cameras if the neighborhood uh, chooses that as one of the uh, the items that they want to to have in that neighborhood. Okay, Laura, if you can uh, go back to the presentation. Thank you. So some of the overall successes, uh, reduction in crime in every neighborhood that we um, implemented the program, just overall improvement of how uh, the residents feel about their particular neighborhood, not just them, but other residents in Fort Worth about particular neighborhoods. Uh, our neighborhood associations have developed a closer relationship with staff and they're able to uh, know individuals to call for certain items, whether it's code enforcement or neighborhood services for housing or public works. So all of these Various departments are working very closely with those neighborhoods that have been selected. We work with all neighborhoods, but we work even closer with those that have been selected for the neighborhood improvement program. As you can see, higher uh, compliance with code standards, property values go up, also more building permits are pulled in particular areas that have been selected. Uh, next slide. Some lessons learned as it, with any program, uh, you go through some bumps and bruises and uh, continue to work on improving. And so it's no different with this particular uh, program. Generally, once a neighborhood has been selected, it's about a three year process by the time all the different parts that have been chosen to be implemented in the neighborhood have been completed, uh, whether it's infrastructure, or uh, su surveillance cameras or uh, park improvements, uh, those type of uh, uh, activities that we uh, utilize the dollars for. Budgets, of course, we have to make sure that we stay within uh, the confines of what that budget was for a particular line item. So we work closely with those departments to uh, look for cost overruns, try to save there. Uh, also, the area that you choose. Uh, earlier in the presentation, we talked about we use neighborhood profile areas and the mapping is a, sort of kind of like a heat map where we look at the most distressed areas. So we try to narrow that down so we can have the greatest impact in the neighborhood versus uh, spreading it out uh, in a larger uh, footprint. Uh, the next bullet where it says not every neighborhood welcomes surveillance cameras. Yeah, we had a very lengthy debate with one, one of our neighborhoods about uh, whether they were needed or not and uh, privacy. Uh, we've shown you some examples where we think it is uh, very beneficial to have uh, cameras, whether it's to reduce crime or, or uh, catch folks that are doing illegal dumping or, or just even a traffic accident to help uh, police with those items. Neighborhoods that have strong neighborhood associations, whether it's this type of program or anything, it's always uh, helpful when you have uh, neighborhood folks that are advocating for their area and uh, supportive of uh, more investment to, to make improvements. Uh, adopt a budget, try to stay, uh, keep from having five years of doing a program. So those just a list of things. Uh, we mentioned $3 million doesn't go very far, but it has had a significant impact in several of our neighborhoods, serving as a catalyst for even more investment. I mentioned Stop 6 now has received a Choice Neighborhood Grant, which is $35 million, uh, along with some other investment that's going into that neighborhood that the city is committed to. 
And so this program, the Neighborhood Improvement Program, was kind of a jumpstart to more activity and more things taking place in Stop 6. Uh, next slide. How can you do it in your own community? So we use um, software called uh, My Sidewalk that has the census data, and that's how we pull a lot of that information uh, regarding uh, education and poverty levels. So a lot of that socioeconomic information. And then we work with our other departments on the conditions of the, of the parks and the streets, the infrastructure type things and come up with a matrix to measure those. As I mentioned, everything is data-driven, it's based on uh, numbers versus uh, uh, influence. So we strongly suggest that you, you look at that. Uh, also, um, make a big deal out of it. So we have big neighborhood meetings, we uh, do presentations at council, so everyone, is anticipating what is the next neighborhood that would be selected. So we, <clears throat> we've been able to really uh, elevate uh, the program and, and, and make it something that neighborhoods really look forward to, as well as our council members. Uh, as mentioned, the city is not driving it. We use data, but we share that with the neighborhood uh, representatives that also play a major role in what they would like to see accomplished in their neighborhood uh, with that investment. And as we mentioned here, we've mentioned it before, we involve the council member that represents that area. Uh, we track data. Uh, we keep everyone informed. We do before and after surveys. So we're constantly measuring uh, what we're investing if it's being effective. Next slide. So we're now uh, year five, it's been our fifth neighborhood that's been selected. And so, yeah, if you infuse some cash, what do you wanna do to try to keep the momentum? So that's what we're looking at now. What are some ways that we can go back and refresh some of those neighborhoods while we continue to select new neighborhoods, whether it's utilizing some of our federal funding in those neighborhoods, whether it's looking for other, uh, resources that we can invest to keep the momentum going. So that's one of the challenges uh, that we're facing uh, as we continue the program and, and, and continue to support those neighborhoods that have been selected some uh, as far back as 2017. So that is it in a nutshell. I left some time for you all to ask questions. I know there's several questions in the chat and we'll do our best to try to get those answers to you today, or uh, you will have your information and we'll be able to share that uh, before the conference is over with. Laura, back to you. Awesome, yes, no, there are tons of great questions. Um, I mean, one, I just wanna say thank you so much for sharing, um, Victor. I mean, I'm just blown away blown away by all that you've done in those five neighborhoods. So thank you so much for sharing. I know I <laughs> have a lot of questions that I might follow up with you after the conference, but um, let's get to some of these uh, questions. I'm scrolling up a bit. Um, I know Daniel Haas asked, are the improvements all completed within the year of designation or does it take? No, they're not in and completed within a year of designation. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, it's anywhere from uh, three to five years. We're trying to cut that down. Uh, it's more, no more than like two to three years. But as you all know, that some of the infrastructure projects takes a little time. Um, so yeah, we're that's what we're working on now is reducing the amount of time that we're spending in the neighborhood on this program and move to the next one. Awesome, thank, oh, thank you. Um, the, next, the next question um, was regarding infrastructure and I believe the Wi-Fi hubs, um, oh goodness, I lost it. Um, infrastructure, uh, what is the distance between the Wi-Fi hubs? What are the security features uh, to prevent illicit and illegal use of the 
public Wi-Fi. Yeah, I, I can't answer exactly what the distance that uh, that is between those, but we can get that answer to you um, uh, before the conference or with our uh, IT people are are uh, installing those Wi-Fi hubs. So I can uh, certainly get that and share with with the group. Was there another part to that question? And the next question is, are there any efforts being made in these neighborhoods to make sure that longtime residents are protected from rising taxes that they may not be able to afford? Yeah, that's a challenge we're all facing in, in this area is that uh, property values are constantly going up. Uh, and long-term residents have a fear of not being able to continue to live in their neighborhood because of that uh, particular issue. Um, so yeah, that's that's something that we're we're battling. Uh, we continue to try to invest in neighborhoods. I told you about some incentive programs we have uh, to basically freeze taxes on some development for a period of time with our neighborhood empowerment program. But yeah, that, that definitely is a challenge, but we're trying to put more affordable housing in these thriving neighborhoods and, and provide resources to existing residents uh, to improve uh, the value of their homes. But the taxes is something that uh, is a battle for, for high growth areas. So I really don't have a better answer for you, but that is something <laughs> that we've been uh, diligently trying to figure out how we can best address that issue. Absolutely. Okay. And the next question um, is from uh, Bashil. And there's actually two questions. So I'll go ahead and read both of them. Um, I know you had mentioned that oftentimes it takes longer than the designated year uh, for these programs, but what happens if these programs need to be longer than a year? Um, and then also, where does the funding come from for these programs? Yeah, as I mentioned, it's our general fund dollars, but it's, it's the source is from our municipal property tax uh, revenue, a percentage of that. And so uh, we try to get the programs, the work done uh, within a reasonable time. We continue to work in those neighborhoods even after we selected the next next neighborhood. So, for example, uh, I listed stop six at the end. That was our very first one in 2017, and so pretty much done with it. There may be just a small bit of money left. Uh, then the next one is Ash Crescent. We have a, a a park project there that still remains to be completed. But we continue to work until that budget is exhausted and we've completed all the activities that were selected uh, by the neighborhood and staff. Um, the challenge now is to try to reduce the amount of time that it takes to complete those activities. But we continue to work on them until it's done. Awesome. Um, the next question from Anaheim is if the improvement pro uh, projects take uh, a lengthy amount of time to complete, um, do you resurvey the neighborhood in case there are new residents or some have left? Um, also, do you have a high turnover of residents in your neighborhoods? We do survey the neighborhood uh, after the program has been completed. As I mentioned, we do a survey before and after. Uh, we have not seen a high turnover of uh, residents. We've had uh, several residents moving in those areas uh, after we made that investment. As I mentioned, uh, with Stop 6 being our very first, I mean, now uh, building permits are just uh, off the charts in that particular area. So folks are wanting to come back. They used to live in the area that have moved away. Um, in fact, the value of the homes that are being built uh, has increased. So uh, it, it's more people wanting to come back to that neighborhood if they grew up there or is even making more attractive to people that are moving to Fort Worth that want to be in one of these areas that city has made an investment. 
Absolutely. Um, we also have a question from Alinda. Um, she asked, are there neighborhood improvement resources that you're aware of for rural, I can't say that word, rural communities, rural communities in Texas? Uh, this is something that we're started and in, in doing it with our dollars, but it's not to say that a city couldn't apply for state community development block grant resources to do some uh, type of improvements in their particular neighborhoods and, and rural parts of Texas. So you would just need to make sure that it's eligible for that particular type of funding and see if there's a way that you can incorporate some of the things that I mentioned uh, that would fit into those eligibility criteria. One, you know, with codes, we're trying to eliminate slum and blight. So that's something that you definitely could implement in a rural community. Uh, also, some of the infrastructure improvements, whether it's uh, the paving or the, the sidewalks, uh, you don't see a whole lot of sidewalks in rural areas, but um, I would definitely uh, say that you could, you could utilize some of those federal funds uh, from the state and, and incorporate some of these strategies. Awesome, thank you. Um, and then I have a question from Miss Yolanda Wilson from Miss Ski. Hello, Yolanda. Um, and she asks, what have been the, uh, the impact on um, illegal dumping? Well, we've utilized a lot of money with our code staff in removing a lot of that illegal dumping. And as I mentioned, we have strategically placed cameras uh, in areas that we have a history of dumping. So I think uh, it has had a positive effect on reducing the amount of legal dumping just because uh, folks realize that they are under surveillance if they're going and doing stuff uh, illegal, like illegal dumping. So uh, our COES team does a massive sweep. Uh, as part of that, we budget uh, several thousand dollars for them to go in and, and clean up a neighborhood and then install those cameras so we can monitor any uh, uh, illegal activity that uh, takes place. Awesome. And, and kind of following up videos, um, Gareth Morgan asked, how long are the videos retained for? Yeah, I'm not sure. I have to get, get an answer for you on, on that, how long they uh, I know I've heard the answer, but it, it doesn't come to me off the top of my head. No worries. And and again, we'll have access to this until the end of August. So um, we'll definitely get some answers to, you, to all you attendees. Um, some other questions include, uh, the let's see, Daniel asked, did you say the count, city council members are the ones who suggest which neighborhoods should be in the pool to choose from? Or is that something that, that your department determines? Repeat that up. You kind of oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, Daniel, he asked um, if you said the city council members are the ones who suggest which neighborhoods should be in the pool to choose from. Yeah, it's a combination. So staff looks at neighborhoods based on data, uh, ones that we know that probably are strong candidates for the program. And then we uh, work with our council members and say, okay, council member, uh, is there a neighborhood in your ward or district that we're missing that we need to take a look at? Keep in mind, all of it is data driven. So even if a council member suggests a neighborhood, we run it through that whole uh, analysis process to see if it scores uh, well enough based on the metrics uh, to warrant being strongly considered or comes out on top based on those metrics. So it's, it's data driven. However, we, we most definitely consult with the council member to make sure there's not an area that we have overlooked that they think should be considered. Awesome. Um, Ms. Dot asked, uh, when you say move money around in the budget, does that mean unspent funds on a line item could be used to another line item? Yeah, that's what we're saying. So there may be uh, some items that we've completed all the work 
Uh, we came in less than what the uh, estimated uh, cost, and there may be something else that we can do more of. So yeah, we can move dollars around. That's what I, what I meant by that. Perfect. Um, speaking of money, um, Lisa asked, um, is the money for each neighborhood placed in your department budget each year? Yes. So each year uh, we have uh, a dollar amount that we're working with. So we know that um, budget time. And so that's how we go about uh, sharing with the other departments how much we have to work with. And then there's uh, some negotiating and working with those departments in the neighborhood on what areas are priority, what do you want to see done, and how much would it cost to get uh, those particular items done. Awesome. Um, uh, Keno Wong asked uh, what the total cost on the camera systems were, if you know. We have that total and we get that. I don't have that uh, readily available. Uh, I believe the flock cameras are, are the most expensive, but uh, to get you a total of what we just did for the, um, uh, the, the uh, last neighborhood that was completed, we can get that for you. I believe maybe in one of the slides, it may have the budget for police and that's pretty much all camera. Awesome, awesome. Um, it looks like Miss uh, Zena Johnson was just giving a shout out about how she looks forward to viewing the video again. And um, she says, this sounds like a great program when you consider the initial 3 million investment. This is little considering the overall gain in so many ways. She says to keep up the good work. Um, Let's see, uh, Theo asks if you are part of the city or a nonprofit. Yeah, I'm part of the city. Uh, my department is Neighborhood Services Department. So yeah, we're one of 22 departments and we work closely with um, our community engagement team and neighborhood associations and uh, various other departments. I guess I didn't mention early on, but uh, we have a unique department. We administer all the HUD federal programs. And then we're one of, uh, I don't know of any other city in Texas, we also do the community action partner. So we have the community service block grant and we do uh, CAP and LIHEAP. So we serve Fort Worth and the county for those social service type activities, whether it's uh, weatherization or utility assistance. And then we have the federal program from HUD uh, that we administer uh, Hopwood and ESG and home and CDBG. So it's kind of a combination. Uh, plus, uh, we have a, our neighborhood empowerment zone program, the NEZ program as well. And uh, we're unique because we have uh, a big part of our department uh, does uh, recreation related activities. So we have community centers. Uh, that we do uh, some after school and summer day camp activities, uh, as well as uh, our parks department. So we kind of share in that function as well. Awesome. Um, and that also answers uh, John uh, E. Baker's question a little bit. He asked, you know, does the program only address physical improvements and if there were any social service programs. And so I think you you mentioned a, a, a few, but um, are, are there any other social service programs that are included in, in this? Uh, not particularly. Uh, the main thing uh, with the program is the, the crime element, trying to reduce crime, trying to improve pro in, increase property values, uh, the overall uh, appearance of the neighborhood. But uh, as a result of that investment, uh, we certainly uh, utilize our other resources because keep in mind, one of the, uh, the things we look at is the unemployment rate in a particular neighborhood, uh, the educational attainment of residents in that neighborhood. So we can direct them to uh, some of the other resources that we have through our 
uh, as you mentioned, uh, we saw earlier Ben Carson talking about Envision Center. So we run a lot of uh, social service related uh, programs uh, through that program that we can target uh, to those neighborhoods. So a lot of it is educating those residents about what we have available. And particularly when we're spending a lot of time in a neighborhood that's been selected, those uh, residents uh, get a chance to take advantage of some of those programs that they may not have known about previously. That's great. Um, a couple more questions I see. Um, one is from Miss Brenda, and she asks if the homes are privately owned. And then Miss Zena asked if there is a fine related to code violations. Um, and if so, has violations, uh, or I guess the number of code violations, have they greatly decreased in these? Yeah, violations have been decreased, but a big part of the program is educating the residents about what are code violations. So we kind of take a step back and don't uh, swing the hammer on the residents when we're implementing this program. It's more about educating them about the violations. Uh, of course, over time, uh, as with any city, you know, you issue notices and then of course, citations for uh, repeated violations, but uh, for a long period of time when we're implementing the neighborhood improvement program, it's about educating those residents about the violations. So we're not, we're not, we're enforcing code, but we're not penalizing uh, the residents for lack of knowledge of what is a violation. So it's, it's a, a strong educational component during that time. I think there was another part B to the question maybe. Yes. Um, are the homes privately owned? Yeah, the, the homes are privately owned. Um, the intention is that when we've invested in these neighborhoods, there has been an increase in the number of permits. So just because of that small investment, uh, it has made the neighborhood more appealing, more attractive, so more individuals are wanting to return to those neighborhoods. We do use some of our federal funds to assist nonprofit organizations and private organ private entities in, in developing housing in various neighborhoods. So, uh, but it still end up being privately owned, which is a funding resource to help make that happen. Awesome. Um, let's see, I see a question. Will his video be put in the file box? Um, Theo, uh, I, can, I can go ahead and answer that for you. The first two videos are in the file box. The third police video, the surveillance camera, for some reason we were having some trouble uploading that into the file box, but we'll definitely try to, to upload that third video um, so that way you could access that. Um, Ms. Vashil uh, asked if we could get a template of that and um, I might need to, to connect with you privately to see what template you're <laughs> what template you're looking for because there were a lot of really great um, workflows and um, charts and tables um, that that were used. So um, Vashel, I mean, might need to circle back with you on that one. Um, Selena asked, um, privately owned and owners live in. Uh, let's see, do private Let's see, privately owned and owners live in the new neighborhoods or are these, oh, I guess uh, Selena is asking if these are rental properties um, or are they homeowner uh, occupied uh, properties that you work with? Yeah, the, the examples that I mentioned, those are, are home ownership that where there's been that increase in number of permits pulled and people moving back to their their old neighborhoods and people moving in neighborhoods they wouldn't have considered uh, previously. So yeah, mostly home ownership. But we do invest a lot in multifamily, but it's not directly tied to this program. Perfect. Um, oh, uh, 
Oh, the neighborhood grading matrix is what she was asking about. Okay. Um, yeah, we can, we can connect with you um, on that. No, that was a really great, um, a great matrix. Uh, any other questions? I think we may have cleared the queue. Um, so if you have any additional questions, feel free, you can put them in the chat. You can put them in the questions portion. Um, we only have a couple more minutes uh, in for this session. I do want to remind everyone that this entire session has been recorded and you'll have access to the recording as well as I think even all the chat conversation and the files until the end of August. So you can come back, watch the video again, or re-download the files um, and still have access to everything. So um, let's see. Uh, Laura, I don't know if you can put my information in the chat. So if anyone wanna contact me or a member of our staff to delve a little bit more deeply, I know we went through this fast and probably didn't do it complete justice as all this involved, but uh, we're very proud of the program. We think it's made a significant difference in Fort Worth. And so, yeah, if anybody want to uh, reach out to us uh, during the conference or afterwards, uh, we'd be glad to talk to them about uh, how to get started. Yes, Victor, I will put your contact information the chat. Let me just pull this up. Um, before we, oh, Ruth, you're so good. Victor's email address is right here in the chat. Um, Ms. Dot says, love this Fort Worth program. It's so uplifting. Um, just tons of kudos and thank yous here. Thank you all for joining us today. Let's see. Yes, thank yous. Um, Yes, Lisa asked if we have an addi additional questions, can we email the presenters? Um, yeah, uh, I'm gonna say yes, Victor, they have additional, okay. If y'all have additional questions, please feel free to, uh, to email Victor. Um, Ruth put his email in the chat, so you can reach out to him. Thank you so much, Lisa. Um, you're getting some great, re great reviews here. <laughs> Um, Thank you all too kind. Absolutely. Uh, well, if there's no more questions, we'll go ahead and release you to your next breakout session. Victor, thank you so much for sharing. It was fantastic. And we'll be seeing you around. Yeah, y'all have a great rest of the conference. Awesome. Um, now, attendees, just a reminder, you can use the back to lobby to go back to the lobby. So we'll see you all around.